now to the approval of our agenda. Yes, sir. Councilmember Cacciardi. Mayor, I'd like to uh, amend the agenda under uh, business items. We would add business item I, and it would be an adoption of an ordinance amending the temporary six-month moratorium adopted under ordinance number 020-19-A. Second. Is a motion and a second to add that to our business items? Any discussion of that? All in favor of adding that to business item 7I, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. The item has been added. We are to our uh, next item. Uh, Eric, do you we want actually to adopt the ordinance or the, the agenda, agenda unless there's any other amendments. Okay, Councilmember. I would Clawson. move that we approve the agenda as modified. Second. Motion a second to approve the agenda as modified. Any further discussion of this evening's agenda? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. We are to our citizen comment period. If you're here for the public hearing for initiative 697 or the surplus of uh, proprietary funds, uh, utility equipment, uh, there's, that's later in the meeting, but any other item on the agenda, this is your time. And please identify yourself for the record. Hi, I'm Margie Moore. I'm from Port Orchard. I just want to let you know that I support the adoption of item 7A, and I wanted to thank you for the hard work that you've done on making thoughtful changes to the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Brandy? I'm not sure that microphone was on. It, it just wasn't quite up. It was, but it was, wasn't up quite up, high enough, I don't think. <coughs> Would you like me to repeat myself? No, I heard you. I was just, it, yeah. for the next person, I just wanted to make sure it was yep. online. Yeah. Thank you. It's on. It's, it's working. On. Others wishing to address the council for items on the agenda this evening? Go ahead. Hi, I'm Tina Meekins. Um, I live in Port Orchard. And um, I also want to thank you for putting this on the um, business items. And I would request that you do adopt it as the wording has now been changed and everything. I think it's fair for everybody. So th thank you. Oh, 7A. Thank you for your comment. Others wishing to address the council this evening for items on the agenda? Hi, my name is Morgan Perry. I used to live in Port Orchard. I now live in Pulsebo. Um, I wanted to first thank you for bringing this agenda item 7A back uh, for discussion, and I hope that you pass it with the new language. Um, this is the last city in Kitsap County that has not passed this ordinance, so I'm really hoping that you guys approve it this evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comment. Yes, sir. I'm Forbes Duncan from Silverdale, and I, I'm here to support um, business item 7A, and I hope you will pass it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Others wishing to address the council this evening on any item on the agenda? All right, there's a second citizen comment period at the end of the meeting. We're gonna move on and close the first citizen comment period. We are to our consent agenda. Council Member Cacciardi. Mayor, I'd move to uh, approve the consent agenda as uh, presented. Second. Second by Council Member mm -hmm. Diener. Discussion of the consent agenda items? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, consent agenda has been approved. We have a special guest here this evening. We have uh, Tim Winter, who's our new South Kitsap superintendent. And I asked him here to come forward this evening and uh, introduce himself to the community and the city council and uh, to say a few words, if you could. So Tim. Great, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Good evening. Uh, this is Amy Miller, who is our communication and public information officer, and she wants to share a, a sticker. We see that the flag is flying uh, proudly here in the, in the building, and so uh, it's nice to see that as we drive through downtown. So I'm just gonna share a little bit about who I am, um, how I got here, and, and the vision for the district, and then if there's a little bit of time, I'll, I'll take questions. So uh, this is my 29th year in education, grew up in Olympia. Uh, the, the last five years, I was a superintendent in the Clarkston School District in Eastern Washington. Uh, before that, I was in Gig Harbor at Peninsula High School as a teacher and a coach and uh, principal. And so my wife and I um, are familiar with the area. We've been married 30 years, and we have three sons, 28, 24, and 20, and 
two of our, our older two sons live in this area, so we had a strong desire to come back to, to this side of the state. And one of the things interesting about being a superintendent is that you, in most cases, are required to live in the district in which you work. And so when we started looking at opportunities, uh, my wife and I narrowed it down. Of the 295 districts in the state, there were seven that we were interested in. Um, and this was, was one of those. And, and we've been interested in, in South Kitsap and Port Orchard for quite some time. And so I uh, feel really lucky that, that we are here. Uh, I've, I've had a great experience so far. This is day 100. And uh, I know that because I've been tweeting every day uh, for the last uh, 100 days. And so my goal was the first 100 days in South Kitsap. This is day 100. My son said, what do you do next? And I, I just said, I'll keep going. So. Um, so again, excited to be here, 29 years in education, second stint as a superintendent, and, uh, and really this was, this was something that, that I had been focusing on uh, for a number of years and, and through a lot of different things, the timing was right this time, and so um, really excited about Port Orchard, really excited about the opportunity in South Kitsap. I think that this community, there's a lot of good things happening, and uh, excited to be part of that. I also think there's a lot of good things happening in our school district, and certainly there are some issues, and certainly there are some things we need to take care of, and, and our facilities is one of those things. Um, but as we move forward, and, and we have a great team of people here, I, I really am excited about where we're going. And so I've been talking about the ABCs, and I think that's appropriate uh, from a school setting. Uh, the vision for this year really focused on this idea of A is alignment, B is our beliefs, and C is communication. So I'll just touch on those just briefly. Um, the alignment really is providing opportunities that are uh, that, that focus on equity for all students. Doesn't shouldn't matter where you live in our school district. You should have the same opportunities as everybody else. Uh, strategies, opportunities, and systems. So we're really trying to get some systems in place that align not just 16 schools, but one school district that contains 16 schools. So that's that's something we've really focused on. The beliefs, uh, who we are as a school district, starts from within and that identity. So we're really trying to work on. Um, you know, what would believe South Kitsap is? What's the South Kitsap way? And as we, as we come up with that identity and that belief of, of who we are and what we can be, uh, we want to share that with the community. My belief is that we should be and could be and will be one of the top five school districts in the state by the year 2025. And, and there's a lot of ways to measure that. There's the finite measurement, which is um, things like test scores, graduation rates, um, our, our DECA program, band program, athletic programs and their success, but there's also the finite measurement, or infinite measurement, sorry, which really is the culture and how we relate to one another. And building positive relationships, having high expectations and being innovative, uh, looking to always grow and get better, um, having a purpose, and then being really practitioners of, of the idea of gratitude, really thankful for where we are. So that's the belief part. And the last part is communication. I think we have a responsibility to communicate not only with, um, with our district, but with our community. And so we're really striving to do that. A lot of that is done through things like uh, social media, our website, newsletters. But, but really, this kind of thing is really what I'm most interested in is face-to-face is -face interaction. Amy and I caught the 5 o'clock ferry from Southworth uh, to West Seattle this morning to connect with commuters who live in our district but work in Seattle area. Uh, road ferries for a couple hours, we're gonna do the same thing on Thursday. So we're doing those kinds of things just to connect. Um, I've spoken at Rotary and Kiwanis and other things, and so, so really that's the communication piece uh, of trying to make our district accessible to all and transparent in all the work that we do. So any questions? I know it's a brief, um, brief overview. I know you have a lot on the agenda tonight, but if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. So, yeah. Any questions? Jay? Just real quickly. Um, what is the one thing that uh, you were here in the spring a little bit uh, during turnover? So, what is the one thing that you found since you've been here in your hundred days, positive or issue that you wish you would have known before you walked in? What did you discover in that drawer? I, there, there's nothing that I wish I would have known. I think I had a pretty good idea coming in. One, one of the things on a positive side, I knew there were really good people in this in this district in this community, and over the last hundred days, that's proven to be even more than I thought. So, really excited about that. Um, I think that, like I said, there are some issues we need to solve, and, and those, nothing surprising, they, they've just become more clear in the last 100 days, and so the good thing about that is that it's, it's um, we're starting to work on those already, and, and my goal is to really listen and learn from, from the people in the district and the community, but not to have a year where we sit still. We want to push forward, and uh, I think it's, the time is now for us as a, as a district and as a community to really start driving forward, and, and uh, I think there's a lot of great opportunity with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you for your time. I appreciate really it. appreciate you being here. Thank tonight. you.
All right, we are to our two public hearings. The first is initiative 976, bring back our $30 car tabs is on the ballot uh, here next month. And uh, Finance Director Crocker is uh, gonna give a staff report on this and then we're going to hold a public hearing. So, Mr. Crocker. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Washington Initiative 976 is an initiative to legislature that was filed for consideration in the 2019 legislative session. The legislature took no action on the initiative, so it will be presented to the voters during the next general election in November. If passed, the immediate impact to the cities would be a repeal of the authority for, for city transportation benefit districts to impose a car tab fee. Under current law, cities have the authority to establish TBDs for the purposes of acquiring, constructing, providing, and funding transportation improvements. To date, over 100 cities have formed TBDs to fund local transportation projects. With 62 TBDs receiving revenue from vehicle licenses fees, 55 of the 62 TBDs used vehicle license fees as their sole source of funding. In fiscal year 2018, vehicle license fees raised $58.2 million in revenue to fund local projects. In addition to repealing city TBD fees, I-976 would do the following. It would lower motor, lower motor vehicle and light duty truck weight fees, eliminate the 0.3% sales tax on vehicle purchases, it would lower the electric vehicle, snowmobile, and commercial trailer, and modify and reduce sound transit motor vehicle excise tax provisions. These actions would reduce direct revenue to cities through TBDs, reduce revenue to sound transit, and reduce revenue to numerous state transportation accounts. These state accounts provide funding for the Washington State Department of Transportation and provide significant investment in transportation projects across the state. These projects include but aren't limited to the following state highway and local construction, maintenance, ferries, and support services, multimodal projects like public transportation, rail, and bicycle and pedestrian projects, and activities of the Washington State Patrol. Uh, within the materials, there's a chart uh, laying out this fiscal year, uh, six year fiscal year impact, and there's also a link to uh, resources for additional information. Uh, I would recommend that we open the public hearing to take public comment. Thank you, Mr. Crocker. It's time I will open the public hearing on initiative uh, six, nine, uh, 967. I think I got the number right, didn't I? 976. Nine, seven, seven, I, I did that earlier. So, so I open, and no one is signed up to testify, but is there anyone in the audience that wish, wishes to testify on this matter? Jared, go ahead. Um, Jerry Harmon, I would hope that you are against this initiative. First of all, anything that Tim Eyman touches, in my opinion, actually hurts most of us in the long run. So I would want you to stay away from it. But also, I know that coming here enough that you need the monies for our roads. So my only hope is that we don't increase it a whole lot you know, over the next few years because it seems like everything else in our life is going up. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else wishing to address the council on initiative 976? I'm gonna determine to get that right. All right, hearing, seeing no one, I'm gonna close that public hearing. We have a sep second public hearing this evening. It's in relation to surplusing of uh, certain property or property in the, your utility equipment. Mr. Crocker. Kurt Reinerson. To the count, present this to the council this evening. Okay. So good evening, Mayor Council. So pursuant to RCW 3594.040, whenever the city council determines and staff that equipment originally acquired for public utility purposes is surplus to the city's needs and is not required for providing continued public utility service, the council may, by a re resolution and after a public hearing, cause such equipment to be sold, leased, otherwise conveyed. City staff has determined that the equipment described on a list provided to the council and for the public, um, for the record, a handful of the items relate to iPhones. Um, there is some printer equipment as well as a gas monitor harness, steam cleaner. There is a 2001 Dodge Ram vehicle, uh, black and white gas alert micro five um, and a couple handheld meters. Again, all of these were purchased with a um, 
proprietary fund, which is the water, sewer, and storm drainage. The purpose of the city of the public hearing is for the city to no longer Items that are no longer in need for use of the city is to provide a public hearing and surplus the items. Therefore, staff requests the city council declare the listed items of utility equipment to be surplus to the needs of the city. A resolution will be brought before the council later this evening for adoption. Okay, staff you. recommends open the public hearing. Okay, with that, I will open the public hearing. This is on the surplus uh, property for the utility equipment. Is there anyone wishing to testify on this matter? Got a couple of vintage 90, a 1999 and a 2001 pickup I've ridden in both of them they're fine condition do they drive <laughs> yeah <laughs> they have an estimated value of one dollar one dollar yes <laughs> Tony is eager to get rid of them throw in the flip phone for free or a flip phone for <clears throat> so, uh, anyone wishing to testify on this matter in all seriousness okay hearing none I will close the public hearing those are the two public hearings we had this evening. And uh, now we are on to our business items. The first is 7A, adoption of an ordinance amending sections 7.01.010 definitions and 7.16.080 operations requirements of Port Orchard Municipal Code, Chapter 7, Animals. Clerk Reinerson. Well, I just want to um, an animal welfare advocate reached out to the city asking the sales of puppies and kittens initiative to be placed back on the city's agenda. At the August 13, 2019 city council meeting, the city clerk was asked if the council would reconsider amending the code to include the ban of sales of puppies and kittens. Council directed this item to, to be discussed at the September 17, 2019 council work study session. And at that session, council was provided a red line ordinance prepared by the animal welfare advocates to consider for adoption. At that meeting, there were minor changes to that proposal. Those included to remove the animal rescue groups from the ordinance as they are not regulated by the state and to include adoption, not just sales of animals and to include the animal control authority agency in the requirement to maintain documentations of where animals came from. With that, those changes have been implemented in the ordinance that has been provided for you tonight. With that, staff recommends to approve the ordinance as presented. Councilmember Ashby? Yes. I move to adopt an ordinance amending sections 7.01.010 definitions and 7.16.0. Eight zero operations requirements of the Port Orchard Municipal Code Chapter 7 animals as presented. Seconded. Councilmember Clausen seconded that. Mm -hmm. Further discussion? I think this is, well, this isn't uh, identical to the code that's been uh, adopted in, in some of the other cities. It is, uh, you know, a good step forward and a good compromise that uh, staff worked uh, with on and then with council's direction. So I, I'm pleased with what has been brought forward. Yes, and I would thank the um, animal welfare advocates <coughs> for providing the language that they wanted to see in the ordinance. I felt it was a very good compromise from where we started um, a year or so ago. Councilmember Rose Pepe. I'd also like to say thank you for you know, continuing to advocate for animals. And I know that this may seem like took a little bit longer uh, than you would like th to bring it back. So thank you for your advocacy. Councilmember Diener. I was also going to thank them for their persistence and, and not giving up and coming back to us. Thank you. Mr. Clausen. Two things I'd like to echo the thank you. And secondly, as a technicality, the ordinance needs a council member sponsor, and I would recommend that council member Ashby be listed as the ordinance sponsor, if she would so agree. I thought I was. Yeah. On page five. What's presented in the packet just has three yellow X's, so maybe I don't have, maybe I have the electronic version. Yeah, maybe the truck electronic. That's why I made the emotion. I saw, oh. They decided I could be the sponsor, so I'm, I'm happy to do that. Great. Well, if it's already on there, then. All right. Other questions or comments? Hearing none, you'll be voting on adoption of an ordinance amending sections uh, uh, 7.01.010 7 
7.010 definitions and 7.16.080 operations requirements of Port Orchard Municipal Code, Chapter 7, Animals. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Congratulations. All right, we're on to our next business item, which is 7B, adoption of an ordinance authorizing a 0.75 FTE increase to 1.0 and a and a point and a point five FTE increase to 0.7 for police records evidence specialist and a new 0.55 FTE court security officer improving an MOU with the Teamsters. Chief Brown. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Chief of Police has reviewed the organizational structure, skill sets, and capabilities of his current staff and requests an, a reallocation of hours in the department, as well as the establishment of a new court security officer position. Chief would like to fill his FTE count and hours appropriated to the department by increasing the hours of current employees, as well as using some of the budgeted hours for additional court security. The Administrative Services Division of the Police Department handles all information flow internally and externally related to the day-to-day -day function of the agency. The division is currently staffed with 2.25 FTE, which is 1.0 1, 1 FTE, 1.75 FTE, and 1.55 FTE. During the 2019-2020 biennial budgeting process, the City Council approved an additional 1.0 FTE to this division. The total budgeted staff FTE count is 3.25, with 2.25 currently filled. Additionally, the Police Department currently staffs the Port Orchard Municipal Court with one public service officer. This special commission officer is responsible for conducting security checks at the entrance to the court, providing security within the courtroom, escorting and remaining with restrained prisoners in the courtroom, and transporting prisoners to the jail. The chief of the police, excuse me, the chief of police and the court administrator recently conducted a security audit of the courtroom and recognized that one officer is not sufficient to accomplish these tasks and keep the public, the court, and the judge safe. One officer can manage the courtroom or the security station, but not both at one time. There's also additional risk associated with one officer taking a person into custody while then leaving the entrance and courtroom unsecured. The court is currently working on additional options for security, but until that time, the courtroom must be staffed by an additional special commission officer. Chief's reallocation proposal is as follows. One, the current 30-hour-a-week employee increased to 40 hours a week, which is an increase of 10 hours per week. Two, the current 20-hour-a-week employee is increased to 28 hours per week, which is an increase of eight hours per week. And three, the new court security officer is up to 22 hours a week, which is an additional 22 hours per week. The proposed structure utilizes the full 1.0 FTE count or full 40 hours, which is currently unfilled within the existing staff. Thus, there is no budgetary impact. The proposed changes rewards current employees with additional hours of employment while also adds a part-time security officer. If approved, the FTE count will be as follows. Two, 1.0 FTE Police Records Evidence Specialist, 1.7 FTE Police Records Evidence Specialist, which is not full-time, and 1.55 FTE Court Security Officer. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt an ordinance approving the reallocation of hours for po Police Records Evidence Specialist employees, authorizing the execution of the Memorandum of Understanding with the Teamsters relating thereto and approving the creation of a new .55 FTE, a job description, and salary range for the position of court security officer as described above and provided for in the attachments. Second. Second by Council Member Picciardi. Do you have any questions to the police chief? So you can just see the, he's got, go ahead, Council Member. Yeah, just one sure. question is, it, it appears that we're approving two separate things within the same vote, right? The MOU in addition to the, is that okay to do that? To have two different things fall under one? Okay, I shouldn't see it very often, so great. And as it was that would be separated. Yeah. Good not question. Not an initiative. It's not an initiative, yes. <laughs> so, and yeah, as you can. And, and, <laughs> and we, there was one FTE of employee mm -hmm. available in his budget. Uh, we didn't fill that. When the new chief came on board, he evaluated things, and this is how he would like to use that one FTE. So. I had one question. Yes. Uh, with increasing hours, and uh, it doesn't require anybody to reapply or re uh, for the job or re, okay, because at some, at some point in time, I know that at some places, if it increases so much that you have to uh, reapply or re uh, post, -job. post job. Yeah. <coughs> Good. 
Correct. That, that's what the MOU for or MOU is for, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. I think you have your two employees actually here. Would you like to introduce them? Uh, yes. So uh, we've got uh, Heather Humphrey, who is going to full time. She works up front. She does a lot of the CPLs. There's been a significant amount of workload increase on the administrative services side of the house with some new laws that went into effect on 1 July in reference to um, emergency uh, protection orders and firearms. And then Holly Lindbury is our, uh, she's primarily in evidence and, and uh, we've got quite a bit of work for her down there as well. Uh, so we really, really do appreciate you guys allowing us to do this because it's gonna make, that, uh, make us that much more efficient downstairs, so thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Thank you. Other questions? No, I just suspect with our new chief um, getting used to his first 100 days that we may have more opportunity to make changes in your department. Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we do currently have uh, uh, a team from WASPIC, which is the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs, that's uh, uh, doing an assessment of us today and tomorrow, and, and uh, we'll be able to use that as kind of a springboard moving forward. Very astute. Other questions or comments? Okay, you'll be voting on uh, increases to, uh, to staff in the police department. I'm not gonna read that whole thing because it was very cumbersome. So all in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, congratulations. We are on to 7C, adoption and ordinance, authorizing the signing of an MOU with the police guild representative rep representing the patrol and the, and the police guild representing sergeants. Uh, Chief Brown. Thank you, Mayor and Council. The negotiations for the 2019-2021 collective bargaining agreements with the Port Orchard Police Guild on behalf of the patrol officer employees and the sergeant employees, the parties made a modification to the language defining which actions were to be considered discipline. As part of those negotiations, educations and warnings were removed from the definition of discipline. Educations and warnings are is also mentioned in Article 6.5 regarding grievances. It was an oversight by the negotiating parties to not make a revision to this language as well. The two MOUs relating to the two collective bargaining agreements will correct that oversight. Councilmember Claussen. Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt an ordinance which authorized the mayor to sign a memorandum of understanding with the police guild representing patrol officers and a memorandum of understanding with the police guild representing sergeants to revise the language in Article 6.5 of each of the respective collective bargaining agreements. Second. Motion and a second by Councilmember Cacciardi. Any questions for the Chief on this matter? I see two other members of our fine police department in the audience too. We have Sergeant Main and uh, we have Deputy Chief Schuster also in the audience. We have all kinds of police department uh, employees here tonight. That's great. Just trying to fly the flag, sir. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> All right, so you'll be voting with no other questions. We'll be voting on the adoption of an, order, or, an ordinance authorizing the signing of an MOU with the police guild representing patrol and the police guild representing sergeants. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. All right, we are to 7D, adoption of a re resolution opposing initiative 976 on the November 2019 general election ballot. Mr. Crocker. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, earlier tonight, we held a public hearing on initiative 196 uh, discussing the facts. Uh, before you tonight, 7D is a resolution uh, taking a position of opposing I-976. And I think there was one other comment I want to make on this is that the initiative would directly impact the city of Port Orchard uh, financially by about $200,000 per year for our transportation projects. So there, there is a direct significant impact to this city if this initiative were to go forward. As such, city staff would recommend approval of opposing resolution I-976. Okay. Council Member Rose of Hepi. I move <coughs> to adopt the proposed resolution opposing I-976. Second. Motion in a second, and I just, there's a link also in our um, packet, and it goes to the AWC mm -hmm. webpage, and it's got a, a very nice uh, fact sheet, and uh, it also details all of the financial impacts, or physical impacts to 
uh, all of the different funds. And as Noah pointed out, it directly impacts the city of Port Orchard to the tune of $200,000 a year. So uh, that would have, uh, uh, you know, definitely impact on the city. Mr. Clausen? I would add a few very close by specifics in that uh, I'm currently the vice president of the Washington State Transit Association, and we've been looking at this issue as well. And it is going to significantly impact transit systems throughout the state in various ways. In the case of Kitsap Transit, it's a bit over $3 million annually that is primarily used for capital acquisition of buses and things. In some cases, like our friends to the west, Mason Transit, approximately 40% of their operating budget will be affected. There are systems in eastern Washington that are in excess of 90% of their operating budget, so they will be virtually shut down unless the local community can come up with some alternatives. So it has a significant impact not only to cities and their transportation benefit districts, as we've read before, to the state patrol, to Washington State Ferries, all the various local jurisdictions that have the benefit districts. And this is a method for which many cities have used to be able to maintain the roads, maintain and improve sidewalks. So there's a number of aspects that will be uh, negatively impacted. So clearly by my statement, you can see that I am totally against the initiative and certainly for this resolution. Others wishing to comment? Councilor Medina? I'll say that, you know, uh, at, at even the first glance on this, I had concerns about it. But um, what crystallized my, my concerns was that there's no real alternative discussion about what you do in light of the cutbacks. So um, with that in mind, I think I'll be voting against it as well. Okay. And if we just point, just make sure we're projecting to our yeah. micro some parts yeah. well. Sometimes it's tough to pick us up. Council Member Ashby? I would just say that <clears throat> My work on the city council has involved a many transportation committees. And when we, and I'm gonna focus on our ever popular Tremont project, but when we tried to get funding for pre Tremont, it was almost required of us to form a transportation benefit district in order to qualify for the grants we were seeking. <coughs> so this was a tool that was provided to us and, and it, it just seems inappropriate for it to all of a sudden. We worked so hard to get the Tremont funding. We put every tool in place we could to solidify that funding. And then to have, to take away $200,000 a year to our annual budget for our transportation needs. And we have many, neighborhoods in our city that could use some improvements on their streets. So I too am, su am very supportive of um, adopting the resolution to oppose I-976. Councilmember Kachardi? Yeah, I would kind of just along those same lines, you know, we are a small city and there aren't revenue streams to be able to support the repair of our roads. And I know at a finance committee meeting tonight, we were looking forward to the second year of the biennial budget, looking at how we're going to, you know, reinvest these dollars back into the repairs. And it would be a shame if, if those got taken away. I know this council made a commitment to stay on this regular plan of, of repairing our roads with the studies that we did that enables us to priority the repair of our roads. And um, as council member Diener said, there just isn't currently another alternative that we have to replace this right away. So it would be unfortunate and I certainly will support the opposition of this. I just wish you to comment. I had a couple of questions. One's a question and I guess one's a comment. And my first question was thinking, of course, that we talk about how cities no longer have the authorization to form a transit benefit district. And I remember thinking that when we, there were a couple of options for a TBD, you could do it councilmatically or matically. You could also do it by a vote of the people. And so it raised the question like, is there an option still to put it on a ballot to, re to replace those funds on the ballot if they're taken away by this referendum? The alter alternative would be a vote and for a sales tax measure. Okay, so there would, would be no the equivalent of replacing the transit benefit <clears throat> district. Not with a car tab, but we could 
we still could have a transportation benefit district but the only tool available in our toolbox would be sales tax and it will require a vote of our citizens to impose a sales tax that's okay. is that correct mr crocker yes the sales tax would be a, a tool that i think if this were to pass we would have to regroup as a council and city and evaluate whether we want to pursue that forward and the second thought that I had was, of course, trying to, you know, as, as we talked about the different effects of, on different, I guess, parts of the state, including sound transit, um, I was concerned because a lot of residents of Kitsap may not be directly concerned about what happens to sound transit. I mean, I, I like what you're doing since I work in Seattle and I, I see the foresight of a transit system, but I think a, a lot of residents may not, so my concern was going back to, what could we tell people about the money raised in our transit benefit district, how it really affects them in their neighborhood, as uh, Councilman Ashby was suggesting. Um, currently, I realize that a lot of it was going to part of the package that we had to put together for Tremont, but it sounds like if this were taken away, um, we would still have to fill that amount for Tremont. It would be taken out of the general fund. Those funds would then be taken out of the funds that we would like to put into people's neighborhoods. But if we could give people, and I know there's not time because the ballots are coming in a week, but if we could tell them like how many potholes does this relate to in your neighborhood or how many, um, I don't know the terms, if we could break it down to local um, impacts, I think that might have more of a visceral effect. Well, what I can speak to, because we had a finance committee meeting earlier this evening, and we're talking about our mid-biennial review and our proposals we're gonna bring forward, which you'll see next week at the work study, is there's $270,000 worth of residential paving that we plan to do next year. And I'm not saying by this pass, if this passes, we're not gonna do that, but it will impact our ability to pave those residents. It's, it's really the street maintenance and preservation, preservation dollars. And, and uh, so we're bringing forward a package to start some paving because this past year we finished up Tremont and that was, you know, a major lift. But it will, it will definitely impact our ability because we'll have to take general fund dollars that, and you know, that's what we use primarily to pay for employees. Um, and so we'll have to make some tough decisions on because we have to pave our streets. So, Mr. Dorsey, do you have a comment? Yeah, I think to answer Councilman Chang's question a little bit deeper. We're talking about the direct transportation impacts to the city of Port Orchard, but I serve on the Public Works Board, and our Public Works assistant, Assistance account in itself is in jeopardy because as these other funds are reduced by the lack of the revenue, the legislature will be looking at other funds, and the Public Works Assistance account is, is out there ripe for the picking. So we're not just talking about this initiative passed passes affecting roads and transit. It's gonna impact water systems and sewer systems and any other infrastructure because the <laughs> legislature will look for other funds to augment. And that was one of our major topics at our retreat on Thursday. So it isn't, there's a, to me there's a larger indirect consequence that theoretically we could use, lose our $800,000 for McCormick Pump Station too. You know, there, Department of Commerce is severely concerned about this initiative within those ranks that aren't transportation related. So there's an unintended consequence. Mr. Claussen? And I would add to that that my understanding is that this money funds the connecting Washington dollars that have been allocated out two or three bienniums into the future that will jeopardize all of those allocations for projects and they vary. I know in the case of Kitsap Transit, there's a transit center in Silverdale that we're planning to construct that there's, uh, I think, two, three million dollars of future connecting Washington funds that have been allocated to that project that would go away. Okay. Others? Mr. Rosepepe? Um, just one comment, not to drag it out, but I would like to thank council members uh, for being willing to discuss this because sometimes I know elected officials don't like to advise on measures that go before the public how, how they feel about it. But this is one of those ones that everybody's talked about is significant. It's going to impact us, it's going to impact the county, and it's going to impact the state. And I think it's important for us to weigh in on these when they affect us this way. 
So thank you. Any other comments? <coughs> okay. I, be, just, I guess yes. the, the last thing I'd want to say is it, this reminds me of the last time, well, I'm sure Tim Lyman's been around every year, but he, when he decimated the state ferry system, John probably remembers the year, in the late 90s, 2000, and it hasn't really recovered. I think we in Kitsap certainly rely on the, the state ferries, or all ferries, and I think that's a good reminder that, um, you know, it, it sounds like you're saving a few dollars annually on your own car, but the system as a whole is really just devastated. Well, and that's a, probably a good example to look back on because what Washington State Ferries did to respond to it was they basically shut down their capital program. Mm -hmm. Now we are with boats that are uh, needing to be surplused and they're in a major building phase of smaller boats and trying to figure out how to get boats just to get their fleet back up to a reasonable standard. So they're still trying to get out of that hole. Good points. All right, any other comments? Okay, you'll be taking a vote on a resolution opposing initiative 976 on the November general ballot. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. We are on to 7E, adoption of a resolution declaring certain property funds, uh, equipment as surplus. Clerk Reinerson. Assets of the city are no longer, um, assets that the city have that are no longer usable and are no longer any value to the city or are surplus to city's needs may be disposed of pursuant to provisions of the Port Orchard Municipal Code 1.30.020 upon a declaration by the city council that such assets are surplus to the city, surplus to the needs of the city. Personal property that the city staff has determined to be surplus to the needs of the city is described um, in a document titled Attachment A. And for the public and for the record, these are items that um, were not used with any proprietary, meaning water, sewer, storm drainage funds. Um, this is um, items that were covered from, I would believe, the general fund. And again, those are similar to the items that were purchased with the proprietary fund, which is outdated phones, um, some outdated computer equipment, um, no vehicles in this one. And uh, however, there is a, a chainsaw and maybe some picnic tables. So there is a, a list here um, and available to the public should they wish to uh, view those. With that, RCW 3594.0. 040 requires a public hearing which was held tonight and for the record was no public uh, testimony regarding the disposal of the equipment originally acquired by the public utility purposes proprietary funds water sewer, water sewer water sewer storm drainage equipment that the city staff has determined to be surplus to the needs of the city is described again in attachment B that was provided um, and summarized to you earlier during the public hearing comment Proceeds from the sale of the surplus property are dis deposited into the fund that own the equipment or personal property. When disposal is to the general public through direct sale, sealed bid, or auction, final determin termination of the value shall be at the highest responsible bid or offer. The city may transfer a surplus asset to another public agency upon written request and determination that is in the best interest of the public. It is my understanding that these items will be offered on a government um, auction site um, and we will be seeking the highest value <coughs> for those items. As um, staff recommends approval of the resolution declaring certain personal property and utility equipment to be surplus to the needs of the city and directing its de disposition thereof. Councilmember Rosa Pepper. I move to approve a resolution declaring certain equipment surplus and authorizing its disposition. Second. Second by Councilmember Chang. Any discussion or questions? Just a quick point of clarification. I thought um, the clerk said that there weren't any vehicles on this one, but I'm mm -hmm. seeing two vehicles on page 56 of 92, a 98 Dodge and a 99 Dodge. And there's it's actually a, a third Vic. one with the Crown, Vic. Crown yeah. Victoria. Yeah. Um, just clarification. Sorry. Mr. Clausen? 
And I'm just curious, I don't know nothing else. There's no value established on any of these items except the vehicles of $1. Is there a, a reason for establishing a dollar value for a vehicle versus a dollar value of a cell phone? The statute requires that, that the city council be aware of the of the value of the items that it's making a decision regarding. And the the uh, accounting value of all of these items is it's depreciated completely and so there's there was a zero dollar I mean there's a zero dollar amount. The same could probably be said of the vehicles, but the, there was some discussion internally about whether that made sense to say they were completely valueless. Uh, but they are they have depreciated below uh, I'm just curious that you put a dollar value on vehicles and nothing else. That right. just right. made them stand out is all. Value on that flip phone. <laughs> the historic value. Exactly. <laughs> Mark, there is an auction. You can participate in the I public. Have, I'm going for it. <laughs> all right. Any other questions on this surplus property? Okay, you'll be voting on to approve a resolution declaring <coughs> certain equipment surplus and authorizing its disposition. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. We're to 7F, adoption of a resolution fixing the date of a public hearing on a petition to vacate city right of way uh, on an alley between Klein Avenue and DeKalb Street. Clerk Reinerson. Good evening, Mayor, Council. So city staff was uh, served um, by a petitioner, Min Chow Trin, owner of 314 316 Klein Avenue. She submitted a petition to vac vacate a city right away. The right away is an alley between Klein Avenue and DeKalb Street. It's adjacent to her parcel that is approximately 2,421 square feet. This vacation is at the request of the code enforcement officer to clean up the encroachment on the city's right of way. Once it has been vacated, the property owner can make repairs to a, de to a deck that is rotting. This item went before the land use committee at their August 26, 2019 meeting. Public Works Director supports the vacation as unopened right of way has no value to the city. The committee recommends approval of the vacation, but they also wanted would like to see that the remainder of the alley be loca vacated. This would extend past the petitioner's property to include an alley behind Halls and Sons as well as the homemade cafe. So for the record, this is the petitioner's property here and she wanted to vacate her whole length of her property and the committee asked that we continue that all the way down. Chapter 35.79 RCW requires that the city adopt a resolution setting the date and time of a public hearing to hear and determine the petition to vacate the city's right away. Staff is seeking direction from the council as to when they would like to hold that public hearing to vacate the proposed city right away. Upon the adoption of this resolution, a staff will post proper notices of the date and time of the hearing and provide notice to adjacent property owners. Staff recommends that the council adopt a resolution setting a date and time of the petition to vacate a city of por to vacate a portion of the city's right of way. It's an alley between Klein Avenue and DeKalb Street. The hearing is pro proposed to be set for Tuesday, November 12, 2019, at the regular council meeting at 6:30 p.m. and directing that the um, directing that the proper posting of notices of those hearing be um, posted. With that, okay, Councilor Dina. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. I move to adopt a resolution setting the public hearing for November 12, 2019, to occur during the regular council meeting on a petition to vacate a portion of City's right of way, an alley between Klein Avenue and DeKalb Street. Second, Councilmember Cacciardi. Any questions, Councilmember Dina? Is there a reason that um, for for economy that we wouldn't look at vacation of the rest of this uh, and just slip the hearing? What was that? I'm sorry? Is there a reason that we couldn't consider the whole right away vacation at one time? Yes, that is the proposal. I'm sorry if that was unclear. It's, oh, not, okay. it's not what the map shows, but that's what, her, what okay, she's read in her staff report. Yes, we have a petitioner that wants that triangle and code enforcement saying, let's clean up the whole thing and that's and that will be what we bring forward I believe. okay I saw that we were looking for that but I didn't see that that the uh, that that necessarily was going to occur thank you other questions 
Okay. With that, you'll be voting on the adoption of a resolution fixing the date of a public hearing on a petition to vacate the city right of way on an alley between Klein Avenue and DeKalb Street. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. The motion carries. We're to 7G, approval of a lease uh, agreement with the Special Olympics Washington South Kitsap flag football program for use of a portion of Van Zee Park. Clerk Reinerson. Yes, good evening, Mayor, Council. You've been busy tonight. I know. So the Special Olympics Washington, which is the South Kitsap flag football program, is requesting temporary use of a portion of Van Zee Park to practice for their regionals. They are requesting use of the field and light starting September 24th to November 21st, 2019, from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. every Tuesday and Thursday. I know it's past September 24th, but um, with the daylight becoming shorter and shorter and the urgency of the use of this field, this item was not presented to a committee, rather straight to a council for consideration. It is standard practice for the city to enter into a lease agreement for this type of request. In the past, the city has leased this use of field to other sports programs at a rate of 249 per year. Staff recommends for consistency purposes that this be the rate for the lease. Since taking ownership of the lights, staff is testing the system to assure that the lights will be turned over, turned on 30 minutes prior to the estimated sunset time and automatic shutoff at the time requested by the organization. So um, when the city staff was presented for this request, um, all, we had to wait for the next council meeting for the council to um, approve the lease. So they are, um, um, Public Works is testing out the lights, and so hopefully over the last week or so, the lights have been coming on and coming off as, um, as programmed. Um, we did have them check to make sure that uh, there wasn't any issues. That way, if there was, then we can modify the agreement before you tonight. Um, there hasn't been any issues, so staff recommends to move forward with the approval of the lease and the use of um, the property as described and depicted on the map here and the lights. Um, awesome. May I move to approve a lease with the South Kitsap Flag Football Program, authorizing the mayor to execute an agreement for temporary use of the Van Zee Park, including the lights as presented. Second, Second by Councilmember Rosapeppe. We have Public Works Manager Tony Lang here in the audience. Are the lights coming on? Yes, sir. All right, wonderful. I okay. have I have a question. Okay. And Mr. Dorsey can probably help me remember, but this has the rent at $249. Um, and in the staff report, it says the city has leased the use of this field to other sports programs at the rate of $249 per year. This group is only going to be using them, the field, for maybe six weeks or two months. Um, do we prorate that? Or do they pay a full full year's worth of rent? And what do we rent? Um, what is our lease arrangement with Little League for Givens? Uh, I can say that I don't have the answer to that. Um, what I do know that at the Little League field, we have just two rentors. We have the South Kitsap Eastern or Western Little League. And then we have South Kitsap Pee Wees. But the lease is to Little League, and Pee Wees uses it. I don't know that we have a separate lease with Pee We have a separate lease for I, them. I do have some information okay. if you'd like to hear from me. So, yeah, we do have two separate leases, one with the Pee Wees and one with the Little League. Okay. They are both um, five-year agreements, uh, and both of those are charged a dollar per year. So they're just $5 agreements for the whole year, or excuse me, for the whole term of the lease. Um, the... Van Zee Park um, a few years ago was leased to the soccer club. And the reason why the 249 rate came up is because if the city were to lease um, uh, any property and it is more than $250, then they are required to pay annual leasehold sales tax. So that's where the 249 came in. Now, if you feel that <coughs> it's less because they're only using it for a few months, then that's the council's Some discussion. Differences too between those two types of leases. One, the Little Leagues and the Pee Wees take care of all the maintenance, and I believe they're paying the utilities on those lights. Where Van Z, it's our park, we're paying for the maintenance, and we're paying the electric bill on the lights. So, yeah, and Mr. Clausen. I, I think with Van Z, we also had to 
enter into an agreement with a company that installed the lights. So mm -hmm. the installation of those lights were kind of on the city's nickel as well, as opposed to the I, I believe actually the soccer club was paying for that, and I think we've since gotten possession of Well, there was an arrangement with the company that provided mm -hmm. it. They were able to get revenue back from those who used the lights, but it was still. Yeah. I think we have sole ownership because they pulled out of their agreement, right. and then they had the prorated payback that the city wrote them a check for $12,000 or something. So they became ours, and I think yeah. our operations manager, Tony Lane, can confirm that um, the we still work with the company back in Nebraska for timing and so there's a certain fee associated with that but we're we're in charge of the lights now other than coordinating with Nebraska point is that there are lights versus yes yeah, right and, and I lights. can understand being reimbursed for the use of those lights when I read this and it says the Special Olympics of Washington and it's a flag football, I just don't want to be onerous on that group. Yeah. I, hear, I hear your point. Is there a motion you're making? I would like to amend the lease to have a $50 rent for the duration of the um, agreement. Okay. There's a motion. An, there's, a mo there's an amendment on the table to uh, make the lease payment $50 I'll for second. the term. And I have a second by Council Member Cacciardi. Uh, discussion of that amendment? Would that $50, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Would that $50 cover our utilities, the lights fee, I guess would be my question. In other words, if it would, then I I'd be fine for, with it. For the short time frame, after probably they're going to run a couple hours a night for three hours for... I'm just asking. They're bright lights. But it's close. Can I get an idea what the, fee, what the fee is to turn the lights off and on with the company? Uh, we took it over for the $10. Okay. And we don't turn the lights on for the tennis courts? The lights aren't on anyway? There, there's a button you hit on the tennis courts that's no. self-controlled. Okay. It works differently. So Council Member Diener? Well, I guess I would just say if, if we want to be systematic about this, then we should prorate it. And if it is six weeks, then that would be $30. That's not, the, that's not the amendment we have on the yeah. table, though. <laughs> I'm, I'm, in, I'm in support of it, but I think that maybe in the future we should look at being Look at the, yeah. the math. Okay. okay. All right. We have an amendment on the table to reduce the lease payment to $50. Any further discussion of the amendment? All in favor of the amendment, say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? There none, the amendment passes. Now we're back to the main motion, which is the lease itself. Any further questions other than the amount now is $50? Okay, all in favor of the lease to the Special Olympics and the South Kitsap Flag Football Program at Vancey Park, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the lease is approved. All right, we're to 7H, approval of the September 24th, 2019 <coughs> Council Meeting Minutes. May I move we approve the minutes as published? Second. Okay. A motion by Councilmember Clausen, a second by Councilmember Kachari. Any corrections or comments on those meeting minutes of September 24th? All in favor of approving, say aye. 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 Opposed? And we have one abstention, Councilmember Ashby. All right, we are on to the last business item, the item we added this evening, 7AI. <laughs> Adoption of an ordinance amending the temporary moratorium. Council member, or council, <laughs> Mr. Bond, you're, no, you're not a council member this evening. The city adopted ordinance number 02019A on July 23rd, 2019. Ordinance 02019A is set to expire on December 11th, 2019 and unless extended by city council. Under Ordinance 02019A, there was a moratorium restricting the submittal of building permit applications for the area covered by the moratorium. Amendments are now proposed to this ordinance that would allow the submittal of building permits for this area, but would continue to prohibit the issuance of building permits in the area. The new ordinance would require that when a building permit is submitted, the applicant must also submit an acknowledgement of risk, a waiver, processing t uh, a waiver of processing timelines, an acknowledgement of the presence of a moratorium in effect that prevents the issuance of building permits, and a waiver of claims against the city. This action is being taken at the request of McCormick Communities 
LLC due to progress in the negotiations on a solution to the water storage and source issues in the 580 pressure zone. The proposed ordinance does not extend the existing moratorium beyond December 11th, 2019. Staff recommends the adoption of Ordinance 039-19, amending Ordinance 020-19A. Mayor, I move to adopt Ordinance 039-19, amending Ordinance 020-19A as presented. Second. Yes, motion and a second by Council Member Claussen. I think this is uh, a, a nice gesture of goodwill uh, to the developer. We are extremely close to reaching an agreement that I would hope um, is before us back before the council on October 22nd and hopefully November no later than November 12th as you as I briefed you previously it's a very complex issue that involves three agreements one between us and the city of Bremerton for more water uh, and, to, and then an agreement between the developer and the city of Bremerton for certain improvements to the Bremerton water system and then a third agreement between us and the, the developer for the construction of a reservoir and a transmission main and a drilling of a pilot hole. Uh, and so those actions, when they ha all three happen, all three of those agreements are executed, will allow us to uh, lift that moratorium. So, uh, Mr. Claussen, you have comments? Yeah, there, there's a couple things that I think are worth noting specifically in regards to this. I mean, it was always been our goal that the moratorium wouldn't continue forever, that we'd find a solution to this. And from my perspective, one of the real advantages to the city in doing this, and I appreciate your comments about the advantages to the developers, is the fact of, of trying to spread out the impact uh, on our DCD when that moratorium is eventually lifted. By doing this, developers are going to be able to put their applications in now, and DCD will be able to process those without the pressure of needing to deliver a permit within a fixed period of time. The permits are still not going to be issued until the moratorium is lifted, but it allows them the time without pressure to, to process all those applications. And I think that's going to be a huge advantage for, for our uh, staff. The second thing I'd like to point out as a result of this agreement that we're having a modified permit application that specifically um, lays out the conditions that the developers, builders, will have to agree to that they recognize that this is just the application process. This does not guarantee them a permit until the moratorium is resolved. So mm -hmm. I think those are two items that are worth mentioning. Yeah. Council Member Picciardi. I just wanted to add just a little bit of clarity to, I think, another stakeholder group that perhaps most importantly um, this positively impacts is the builders, right? I mean, they kind of got stuck in this. It really wasn't a good, the, the, you know, the builders bought these lots from the developer mm -hmm. and, you know, necessarily weren't aware of all this. So they're the ones kind of sitting in these lots waiting for these permits. And so it allows the builder the additional confidence to move forward as well. And so um, they don't really have a seat at that table while we finish out the plan for this. And so it's great to be able to um, provide that service from, from our city staff to those builders to keep the, keep the pipeline moving forward. This is a good step towards the eventual lifting of the moratorium when we get these other agreements in place. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Mr. Shane. I have a minor comment, which is basically, before we put this on the website, I would recommend that we add a word to it. For example, the sentence that says, amendments are now proposed to this ordinance that would allow the submittal of building permits for this area. We really mean building permit applications that they can submit. Because it's on, yeah. I think I think just the way it's written may be a little confusing because we don't say the word applications there. It, is, it of course follows on the application itself and the ordinance, but if someone were impatient and only reading the uh, staff report, they might be confused, as was I. Good point. Other comments or questions? On the, uh, just one real quick one, on the uh, moratorium uh, building permit application where we Amend, you know, put in, put in red. I don't know, and you know, I'd look at Sharon and ask her opinion whether we need to bold any of those sections or not. I know we put them in red, but it, it, you know, it just kind of scares me that you know, underline or somehow make it clear 
-hmm. Yeah, I think I think that what the staff has done to to call that out, um, and and I'm sure when when the uh, the applicants are filling out the form, that's going to be called to their attention as well. But you're right; it is it is critical information for them to understand as they're signing. And it is in red. Okay. It could be bolded. Why um, not? Uh, I was thinking of D, where it says, you know, I, I won't sue or go against if it goes out further, and I'm just, you know, it just concerns me. That's all. Questions? I'm, I'm also sure staff will be advising them of this as well as they come in. Yes. I'd like to have a document signed though with their name on it so there's no <laughs> argument of what they got. Yeah. The red, the red ink is right above their signature. Yes, exactly. Okay. I just, how much, how many um, applications are we anticipating? There's a hun roughly a hundred lots. <laughs> roughly a hundred lots. We, so word on the street is about half of those will, okay. will come in. So it will be a time savings to the builders to be able to turn these applications in and help your department get them processed. Correct. And I think the plan review, that's the most time consuming part of the whole process. And so giving our building inspector time to go through these before we have to issue them is hopefully going to uh, keep our timelines at the, at the four to six week range rather than extending it beyond that time frame. Thank you. Mr. Dorsey. And I, and I know you already mentioned this, but I want the viewing public out there to reinforce the thought that by going through this process, the city is receiving at the cost of the, at the expense of the developer, much needed infrastructure that benefits the city, both yes. the city of Bremerton and the city of Port Orchard. Yes, and, and those, that re repayment is coming in the form of connect from the connection charges at, um, in a, through an existing agreement that we have that was entered into in 2007. So, um, you know, developers stepping forward, making millions of dollars in infrastructure improvements, which benefit the lots he's selling, but it's not being paid, going to be paid for by our ratepayers. It's going to be paid for some of the connection charges generated from the lots being sold in, in that specific area of the city. It's also my understanding that when those agreements come before us, either the end of the month or sometime in November, if you've indicated that we will have a very transparent discussion about the agreements and, and what the financial arrangements are within those agreements. Absolutely. Other questions or, or comments? Okay. You'll be voting on uh, adoption of an ordinance amending the temporary moratorium in the McCormick Woods area. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the uh, ordinance has been passed. Okay, I've got a couple of discussion items uh, on tonight's agenda. The first is, is a flyer that Jeanine put on the dais. This is from the Kitsap County's fireworks ban. They did this kind of at the 11th hour at 4th of July this last year. <coughs> and since most of the fireworks stands uh, that are in the south end of the county are in the city of Port Orchard and they benefit nonprofits, we just, uh, the discussion was not to take any action because uh, likely most of that inventory had already been ordered uh, for those nonprofits. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about this and what what the county's ordinance did, it banned, and what's still allowed are the parachutes, um, the small devices, sprinklers, uh, reloadable mortars, and fountains and cones. What's not allowed under the county ban is the Roman candles, the multi-tube uh, cake devices, aerial spinners, multi-shell devices, and ground spinners. And just for reference, what's not allowed uh, under state law, but uh, uh, there's places like the reservations that people do buy these things and bring them in other places. Pipe other bombs? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> firecrackers, uh, skyrockets, uh, you know, other large explosive devices as uh, Council Member Clausen's uh, referencing. Also in the last week or two, the Bainbridge City Council banned firework personal fireworks altogether. And so I'm just looking for some direction. Do we want to, you know, the fireworks that are being discharged or purchased are, are in, at least in the south end of the county, are primarily being sold in the city of Port Orchard. The stands usually aren't in the county. And do we want to mirror um, 
something similar to the county uh, and bring that back or do we want to have a bigger discussion similar to what Bainbridge Island did and that's a question uh, what would council member Rosepepe I know uh, I believe last year that the county at the last minute was uh, was talking about banning fireworks because of how dry it was and that's this that's under an emergency under ordinance an emergency, right which we have that ability to with our fire marshal I, I understand that but I mean it was it came down to that where the county was almost talking about that mm -hmm. and um, I think that I would um, like to see us be a little bit more proactive on what we allow but also take a look at what the weather forecast is uh, you know for for the season because if we have that dry yeah, and, and that those emergency actions isn't for this body. That no. that is the 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 fire authority is doing that, and we've given them this this body gave down that authority to look at the conditions and potentially pass bans. Okay, the the what I'm looking for direction on policy whether you want to ban certain devices or not. Um, and Councilmember Clausen. I don't have a problem with what Kitsap County has done here, except that I would like to make sure that we schedule a public hearing and get the community's input on before we take any actions on it. Okay. Councilmember Diener. And as I understand it, this is also to help the buyers of fireworks understand what they probably should, should be focusing on and what they shouldn't be focusing on. But I'm in support of um, looking at reducing the, the uh, kinds of fireworks that are available as well. I just think it's appropriate if we're gonna do it, we do it. We should do it soon. Soon, so that we're not catching these nonprofits off guard and, uh, that, that are buying the products that are for sale. I think it's great. I think a public hearing would be great. You know, as I look at this list, I, I was shocked to see that what's still allowed are these reloadable mortars. They may be the, the largest of all of these kind of on this list. That's shocked me that that's in that yeah. list. And, might have discussion about that if we decide to move down this road a little bit. Yeah, the, the fire marshal can can actually, if, if you wanted to have him come as well, he can actually talk about why some of these are uh, less of a fire hazard than others as well. And he has commented on that specific kind of mortar tube before. Councilmember Ashby. Yeah, well, where I live, I enjoy the fireworks, okay? Um, and I don't have a problem. I don't know what fireworks is, what fireworks is. Is this what the fire marshal thinks is appropriate? I'm fine with that. But in my neighborhood, and the city of Port Orchard has a lot of people join us on the 4th of July because there's a large fireworks display out in Sinclair Inlet. But we also make close Bay Street and make Bay Street one way and cars start parking down there at eight o'clock and from my home I watch fireworks from eight o'clock until 11 and I would not like to see that go away um, I have I have appreciation of not liking fireworks on the street behind me but those folks that come down and light their fireworks and it goes out over the water, I don't have a problem with that at all. And we're not proposing I'm allowing it in one areas or the other, but I it's know. just the, it's the devices and as a whole, some of the like devices. To echo what you said is that I have no problem with the lawful um, practice of fireworks in the neighborhood. Um, and it would be very nice if people respected those hours. Mm -hmm. And days, because they you hear days before and after, also after 11 p.m., and we hear a lot of loud things, and there are a lot of um, sensitive pets that are susceptible to this. So um, I don't think banning it would be practical or feasible, um, unless the whole county did it. But I don't I don't see that happening. And I'm sure our police chief is looking forward to to policing fireworks this next. Yeah, yeah. we'd ever get to a complete ban, but limiting yeah. what the county did, I think is, in my opinion, would be acceptable. Right. Mm -hmm. But I, again, I would really want to have a public hearing so we could hear what the community thoughts are. Because we've heard over the years, we've had folks that live up by you that have come here and had major, major issues with it. And we've had others that enjoy them. Yeah. So 
just like to hear the community side. So, so, so I'm hearing support of having a public hearing and potentially passing an ordinance that mirrors what Kitsap County has done, limiting certain fireworks. Uh, and, and doing it sooner than later. Yeah, so sometime in November, probably let's look at maybe the second meeting in November. We shouldn't do this at Christmas. Before January 1, mm -hmm. isn't that a day that's yeah. um, acceptable? And somebody talked about inviting the fire chief too. I think fire marshal. Marshal. Fire, fire marshal. marshal. County, county fire marshal yeah. with Dave Lyman is who would, would be that expert. Um, so he could come and speak at that public hearing if he, mm -hmm. if he wished to. Okay, next discussion item is house related to House Bill 1406 which we took action to uh, capture that revenue from the state. It's uh, coming, gonna come to us as a city. It's gonna be between 30 and 35,000 and I've been working with two nonprofits that gave, me, gave us two distinct uh, uh, options to deploy those. I guess my only ask is it's not a lot of money and staff and I would ask that we pick one of the two, because we got to administer a contract and it's not a lot of money and maybe in later years we could add something to the menu, but I'd really like to start with one type of service. And so the two services are, one would be Kitsap Community Resources, their housing solution centers offering rental and utility assistance. Uh, if utilities are included in the rent, they would charge 8.3% of, of what we give them and is an administrative fee. Guidelines for these funds would be seniors or veterans that are literally homeless, street shelter in place uh, or, or a place not meant for habitation or fleeing domestic violence or the minimum risk of losing housing, a pay uh, to vacate notice. Housing must be within the city of Port Orchard and they must be at 50, percent of area median income the minimum house uh, the maximum household uh, cap for assistance would be two thousand dollars per month the second alternative would be by housing kitsap and they have a wait list of seven combs currently in port orchard for this program and it would be rehab grants for low-income homeowners these grants vary from eight to eighteen thousand dollars per grant they prevent loss of home and it allows seniors to age in place. These are for the life safety improvements like roofs, bathrooms, mold, windows, and emergency access uh, modifications. So if you guys like to talk about that a little bit and maybe give us some direction and then I could potentially enter into negotiations for a contract with hopefully one of these two agencies. Point of clarification, do you think on the KCR one that you meant to say $2,000 per month or do you think that's an annual max is 2,000? A max of 2,000, which I think is a lot. That's what but, it could be, but it could be a family and a house. Right. Um, and I neglected to say too, the housing Kitsap request uh, has a 10% administration fee, slightly more. Um, I think they're both very, very worthy programs. And, and I think this is, It'd be great to have these resources in our community. And, and maybe you want to put a cap lower than that on the program. This is, was their proposal. 2,000 is per month. Per month. Okay. <clears throat> There's only 35,000 in there. That yeah. It, it, Sean, you, yeah, he hit on what I was thinking. If the housing Kitsap, if it's 8,000 to 18,000 per grant, and say we have 36,000 just for round numbers, potentially we could be only four. doing two houses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Two to four. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we may impact more people if we go through the Kitsap community resource. Well, it is interesting with housing Kitsap, why they limit it. It has to be a minimum yeah. of 8,000. What if someone really just high. needed $1,200 worth of work done? And, and that isn't the minimum. That, that was just the range of, they, they, they've been running this program for 15 years okay. through a grant. Um, and so that's why there's currently a wait list. They do, they do two or three of these a year. And that's just typically what it costs to okay. modify somebody's bathroom, put some windows on, you know, a roof. Wow. You know, there, well, there, sometimes there are lesser things. I, I guess in not having a lot of time to think about the two options, I'm looking at it from the standpoint that either one is going to help 
low-income families, regardless of which one we pick. The advantage to Housing Kitsap is not only do we help the low income, but we're also improving the quality of housing stock in the city of Port Orchard, which hopefully will go on for a period of time. Um, I, maybe you could negotiate that administration fee down a little bit, but I don't I'm, think I'm so. Kind of uh, being being on their board and the financial situation they're in, I don't think so. But. Okay, well, I would hang up over a little bit over. of a, yeah. Okay. But I, I'm leaning more towards the housing kits app only from the standpoint that it's going to improve the housing kits stock. App. Council Member Chang? I actually lean the other way. Uh, I hear, I, I like the argument that we are potentially improving the housing stock in the city because that benefits all of us. I was looking at it a little differently. I was thinking, not so much KCR, but which program would help more people, more individuals? Um, and when I read it, when I saw the maximum per household cap for assistance, I thought that would just be 2,000 per year. I, that's, that's the I, way I, I read it. I can confirm so, that, but I don't believe that would be so less know. than $200 a month. And that isn't, is, when we're dealing with somebody that is homeless and, and trying to get them into, into, a, into housing, I, I'm pretty sure it's, that I, will con I can confirm that. Um, and maybe, you know, I'm, I'm hearing some discussion. Maybe I want to bring this back and let you guys stew on this. Yeah, it makes know, sense what you're saying. Because it says they're literally homeless. Yeah. So it's not like you're subsidizing them. They don't have a current home. Yeah. They're about to lose their home and they're behind on their rent and they've been given a notice to vacate. Um, so they're in that notice to vacate, they're most likely behind on their rent. And so they're having. This they could program. consume that two thousand a month easily just to make up for what they're buying. Right, right. That first month, and then getting something, you know, smaller than that thereafter. So I'm hearing housing Kitsap. I'm hearing one for KCR. Others. Well, I'd right. like clarification on the on the two thousand. It, it seems awfully high on, on a per month basis. Um, I can but do I, that. But I also like the reach that KCR gives, which is broader than what housing okay. Kitsap would. But I do appreciate the argument of better housing stock as well. Okay. I need more info. Uh, what other info one, other than well, the Well, the info is the t you know basically the 2,000 because if you look at it as saying 2,000 per month, you're literally only going to be help be able to help one or two people mm -hmm. uh, in either situation. So my, I would if it was a decision tonight, I would say it would swing toward the housing. Well, stock. I'm not asking you to no, approve a contract tonight, but I understand that. that and, and knowing what rents are, mm -hmm. I mean a two bedroom apartment out there right now is fourteen hundred dollars a month and right but I suspect someone with a fifty percent of AMI is not in a yeah. fifteen hundred dollar and and I'm sorry I didn't I really would like more clarification on this because I assumed what this was is people that um, are having trouble with their rent and we pay their rent for a month or two um, and not for an entire year. So I would really like more clarification on what that program actually looks like. Okay. I, so concerns you have are the, what, whether that's $2,000 monthly and yeah, whether there's a, is there a maximum is it, and then and a cap. Yeah. Okay. And a cap. And again, so one this thing is about the housing side is that you, you solve one person's problem and then you move you can, on to the next. That right. probably is is finished you put a new roof on it and you go to another house so <clears throat> so two questions I've heard on the KCR program one whether that is a two thousand dollar a month subsidy and whether or not it, if there's any sort of a cap it's your program um, we're, we're contracting I mean they have a program and they're they're just rolling a program out this program exists in our community uh, actually throughout the whole county and KCR manages a program like this, we're making additional resources available in the city of Port Orchard. So I will get those two clarifying other questions and I'll bring this back in two weeks because I won't be at the work study next week. <coughs> those are the two questions, okay. A, a, a cap on, per residence, <coughs> resident, whether there is one or we, if, if, if we wanted one, what would you want it to be? An annual cap? I'm, I'm fairly confident it's two thousand dollars per month, and let's just let's work with that assumption until I hear otherwise. Well, I would ask that 
They're the experts. What, yeah. what do they recommend, right? They deal with this every day. What, what's the, the best tool? Is it three months? Is it six months? Is it 12 months? Okay. You know, they're in the field every day. What's their recommendation? Would you like somebody term? from that organization to come and talk? We just, we need to get this done by the end of the year, I believe, is our I deadline. <coughs> and so we've got some meetings. We just can't go on. I thought it was July of next year. We had to have the ordinance done. Um, not positive about that. I think the money starts showing up around July, if I remember. Yeah, and, and even if we, if, if the money starts, if it, if you turn the faucet on, you know, it's sales tax, and there's right. a lag, and, and we right. won't start throwing this money out until right. um, we have the money. Which there's the only difference tax. is that this sales tax is already being collected. It just Correct. takes it out of the state's checkbook and puts it into ours. So it's more of a paperwork process than it is to start collecting it from the retail outlets. Right. Right. And then I guess the question becomes, without looking at these two programs, is what is our intent for that 36000 Is it to help as many people as possible, or is it to help a few people for a you know, for a year, um, or well, I think I want the help to be meaningful. I don't want yeah. you know if right. it's only for a month, and we, do we really help anybody? So I want it to be meaningful, and that's where hopefully these experts can, you know, help guide us to what what's most meaningful. What's the most meaningful need out there? Yeah. Okay. You've given me some questions to get asked answered, and I will bring I them back. Clarify with the housing authority on is that the average? Is that the range, or is that really a? It is an average. Floor and ceiling. Okay. Yeah. It's an average. There's no floor ceiling, I don't believe, but there's a finite pot, and we don't even at the board see these proposals. There's just there's a a, a grant they get um, from the CBDG money, and it comes in, and that's how. And they're managed. They're doing a similar program countywide, and we would just hone it in to dollars being put to work in Port Orchard. So, okay. I will bring that back at our, at our next council meeting on the 22nd. Uh, council committees, uh, finance committee, you just met this evening. We did, and we basically went over the, the financial report, but spent most of the time looking at the uh, mid-year biennial review. The rest of the council is going to see it all at the work study. Um, Noah and the mayor just kind of went through what they're proposing in the way of changes. We talked about the uh, staffing change that the police chief recommended and we approved. And just in case you wanted to know, the committee was supportive of you approving it. So, And we did talk briefly about the uh, uh, legal services contract coming up and we've asked that we go out for an RFP or RFQ, whichever the case may be for that. And I think pretty much well, we talked a bit about the health district and uh, they have requested some additional funding from the city of Port Orchard. We're currently contributing a uh, dollar per capita for the city and Paulsville and Bainbridge are at three dollars per capita. So we were really only talking about an additional thirty thousand dollars a year if we go up from the dollar to the three dollar to match what um, the other two smaller cities are doing. And the committee's recommendation was that we should move forward with the, the three. So I think that's going to be brought forward and presented to the full council next week at work study. It'll be just blended right into the. Uh the biennial budget review. Yeah, so. so it's just kind of one of those things. So I think that's, did I miss anything, No, our committee members, other than what we've already acted upon here? I don't think so. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. And uh, economic development and tourism? We're going to meet next Monday, 930, here in council chambers. Okay. Utilities, council member Lucarelli is in here. I don't believe the committee, the committee has met. Mm -hmm. The next meeting, it appears, is October 21st mm -hmm. and sewer advisory is not till November 6th land use have you set a meeting date no we're gonna do that tonight so let's huddle okay. right after this yeah meeting. let's huddle um, see okay. what we can land on lodging tax I know you've been meeting we did we met twice last week and uh, we had the first meeting uh, was the presentations by people that were applying for LTAC 
and the second meeting was a discussion and allocation of, of funds uh, to bring forth before the council. Um, Brandy will be allowing me to do a briefing of you at next week's work study and then bringing it in November. Uh, and I think, uh, I think you'll be pleased. We kept uh, within the biennium uh, budget uh, as a target, so that should make everybody happy. And uh, we had some good discussion. And it was uh, very appreciated with uh, uh, Chen uh, Park being there from uh, uh, Comfort Inn, uh, along with the, uh, the folks from the Saints and uh, Jack Edwards from um, the other property. Days and Days Inn. And who was it? Uh, oh, and then Matt from the Chamber. So it was a good committee, good discussion, and I think you'll, you'll be happy. I think you'll be pleased. Oh, wonderful. Um, Chess Festival Chimes and Lights. Cindy's not here, so I'm sure she'll give us a report next week. Outside agencies, last week was Super KRCC. Was there anything other than the, the retreat is coming up? And Council Member Rosa Pepe is going to fill in for me. I'm out of the office that day. Um, that's and right in the legislative reception. Mm -hmm. And I believe everyone, if you have not, will be getting your invitations to that. Yes. Um, Transit. How's the two boat service going, John, over in Bremerton? It's actually doing surprisingly well. The ridership on the second vessel is um, basically in the 50 to 70, 80 yeah. per directional sailing. You know, it's commuters are going to Seattle in the morning and there's not much coming back in the morning, but they're all coming home in the evening, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But the real interesting part is it really hasn't detracted from the ridership on the current or the previous scheduled sailings. So they're maintaining their ridership while these others are jumping on board that second sailing. So nice. we've got another week uh, for that to operate, I believe. We needed to operate it for four weeks to get sufficient sailings in for the week study so and if you haven't ridden the waterman it's very nice mm -hmm. i really really like it and it's quiet and uh, it's a nice nice new amenity in our community um all right i can't think of anything else for the outside agency health district we covered they're asking some additional funds and the county pays seven dollars per capita so we're significantly and we get the same services as all the other cities so um i'm thankful that we're gonna step up and pay our pay our share to that agency that's they do good work uh, we are to the mayor's report and uh, so I just want to you know it's been a couple weeks since we've had a meeting but uh, we and I want to and I said I don't see the folks from Whiskey Gulch here tonight but there was a meeting today uh, with Mark Dorsey our right of agent and our legal counsel with their legal counsel I understand it was a very productive meeting and um, I'm just going to leave that at that. We have met with, with those folks, and I hope we got all their questions answered. So, But we've had a number of very critical uh, statements in, in our public comment, and I would just like to address some of those in my mayor's comment. So um, the Bay Street, uh, uh, you know, about the Bay Street pedestrian path primarily, this, you know, as I stated in our um, – on the September 17th work study, the city has not ever taken a vote regarding condemnation or eminent domain for the pathway project. And as I said, this was addressed at the September 17th work study, but continues to be raised as a concern. And based on the direction given by the council on October 2014, the city has entered into a right-of-way contract with Tierra Right-of-Way Services to negotiate with proper, uh, property owners for the Bay Street pedestrian pathway phase two. Since the city has accepted federal funding for the pathway project, the city must conduct all negotiations for the project through our selected right-of-way agents. City council members and the mayor are restricted from meeting or negotiating with affected property owners in these federalized processes. These actions, if we did, would jeopardize the city's federal funding. Uh, I know many of the property owners have been contacted by, by Sierra Tierra right-of-way services regarding their property, and if they have not, they will be in contact soon. I've also heard uh, that, uh, that the count city council lacks transparency in their actions. I want to assure everybody, the city council has a committee structure. All of the meetings are open to the public. 
Just like these council meetings, these meetings have minutes and they have audio recordings and we post those on our website. So just wanted to address a few of the statements that have been made uh, here. And then uh, some, some positive things I wanna talk about, I don't know, downtown parking. Um, you know, we had the merchants approach us about making some changes and I've been driving downtown quite a bit lately and just kind of monitoring some of the parking situations. And, and no one is parking in that merchant lot. Um, we, we, we set, there's almost a dozen stalls there. And I think we need to change, one of the changes we need to make is to change those stalls to four hour parking, but still allow merchant passes to be issued. So someone could get a merchant stall pass, park there and be exempted from that four hour uh, restriction, but we've got a handful of parking stalls that are, that are being held and nobody's using them at all. So I, I think we need to change that. I've also spoke with Cody Morgan, the owner of Peninsula Beverage, who's moved into the old Amy's site. The, they got the sidelines opened and they're working still on the restaurant site. And uh, talked to him about this the lot three, which is just north of him, half of it is paid parking, the other half is two hour parking and the merchants wanted us to change that to four hour parking. I've talked to him about that and he fully supports that idea and he thinks that's a good idea. <clears throat> I think most of his business is probably after parking enforcement is going on anyhow. Um, and the last question I have for you, other than those two recommendations to change those to four hour, I think we need to have a conversation about parking rates, it's been a few years those lots are full every day, the paid parking stalls. And um, I don't think that's the best use of our waterfront. Um, and I think we have a supply and demand issue here and uh, we probably need to raise the, the all day rates. And I don't know what that is, if it's a dollar or two a day. Um, we sell parking there every day. Does anybody know off the top of their head what it is a day? Eight dollars. Eight okay. If, if I could comment there, we did this a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. It's full again. Well, it did work for a little while. All right, but yeah. it didn't work. And so I don't know that so much we have a rate problem. If we have, if we feel like we need more parking for our downtown area, then we could take some of those out of the inventory for all day parking, right? And start training people to park elsewhere. Because I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a rate issue. I think people will pay two more bucks. Well, I, that's great if they're gonna, if I'm hearing $10, then great. I don't, when I drive down there, I can find parking. Uh, you know, but the, but the commuter lot is full. There's no doubt about that. But the four hour lots, and in particular, if we add these stalls and make another dozen stalls down uh, towards Kitsap Bank there, I mean, we're adding to the inventory uh, for that four hour, two and four hour need. I think I'm not, and Council Member Ashby, you park downtown too. Um, do you have, I, I have an experience never not finding a parking spot. Right, I, I don't have a problem finding a parking spot downtown unless I'm late in getting down to the paid parking um, because there are mornings when I want to take, uh, I need to take the ferry to Seattle and I will park down there and, and if I'm catching a later boat, I, yes. there, it, it isn't available. I mean, I think we could easily add more paid parking but it, and, and, and fill those stalls with revenue but I don't think that's the right thing to do right. to our waterfront. That's, that's what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Mr. I was, Clawson? you know, I would be an advocate for whatever we do with the commuter parking is also provide incentives for carpools and vanpools because you're right. going to get more people to benefit or fewer parking spaces by doing that. Um, our challenge is going to be, I know Kitsap Transit has cameras to monitor that and that's how they police that. I don't know how we would well, if you were face to, that carpool. If you were to do it just in a vanpool only kind of a situation, vanpools are pretty obvious and they have to have a minimum ridership to just exist. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, once again, you're providing benefit to a lot more people with fewer parking stalls. So okay. There are programs, well, we have a carpool registration program that we require people to register on a monthly basis. Um, so you've got to get two people to come lie to you that they're carpooling together if you don't trust them. But for the most part, if they're going to go through that process once a month to recertify, they're probably doing it properly. 
and that's a free program that's available to the city if you want to use it. I just was going to ask, and those are take-home vans, right? The van pool vans are take-home yeah, vans, yeah. Okay. And I'll just add that I don't have a problem parking downtown whenever I need to. So I, is there support for changing the two hours, to the merchant to four hour? Because we need to bring an ordinance back, so I'm just trying to... I think it's a good idea. So I, I think so those two <coughs> changes that I, Brandy, do you capture that? Lot three, to change that from two hour to four hour, and to change the merc merchant lot to four hour. And now the big can of worms is, do we want to bring study? to bring it back to a work study to talk about well, parking that. rates? Yeah, yeah well. The mayor's report. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So we'll, we'll address the two immediate parking needs, and let's bring back um, November's work study. Let's talk about parking rates. Well, rates and in and space. programs, incentives, yeah. incentives like, mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe somebody at, at Kitsap Transit could uh, reach out to our staff and maybe come and talk to us about what that program could look like. Do you have somebody that manages that program? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so maybe they could be available to our work study if, if Transit yeah. could spare them. Sure. Okay, um, moving on. I've, uh, as you know, I'm on the AWC board, and we had our board meeting here a week ago Friday. Uh, we talked about AWC's legislative priorities. We talked at length about Initiative uh, 976 and the impacts uh, of that. Um, the legislative priorities that AWC uh, adopted at that board meeting, uh, which I'm proposing that we put on as also on ours that we support uh, AWC's legislative agenda, and their uh, their agenda is um, to support a uh, pursue a comp in the help pursue a comprehensive uh, transportation bill, like we w was brought forward that had the Sedgwick interchange fixes on it. Um, what could totally blow that up? You mean the like pursuit? the Hobbs bill? The Hobbs bill, correct. And what could totally blow that up is uh, 976. Uh, would uh, totally change the, the what that could look like to pursue uh, infrastructure funding uh, for the public works uh, trust fund and uh, to pursue tools for economic development uh, to uh, preserve city fiscal help and with secure funding sources uh, to uh, support for behavioral health to support statewide medicated assistance treatment services in city and regional uh, jails are full and to be funded by the state and in feasible uh, uh, local jurisdictions and to come up with a comprehensive approach to the culvert uh, issue because the state's fixing its culverts it isn't always the culvert that's closest to the sound and uh, once the state fixes all of its problems, if we don't come up with a comprehensive solution, it's believed that the cities will be the next in the crosshairs of uh, in litigation. So we would like the state to uh, look at a prioritizing these culverts and, um, and then also put a, a package together that funds not just the state's culverts, but the, uh, the ones in the counties and cities too. So that, uh, uh, we have the KRCC board retreat that we already spoke to. Um, I'd like to start thinking about a retreat for all of us right after the first of the year, maybe January. Um, do we want a half day or an all day like we did, or do we want to devote a work study to it? And, uh, and, for, and I'm thinking like long range planning and setting the table for what our priorities are for that <clears throat> budget process we're gonna start in the summer. Staff's gonna start in the summer. We went some direction on that before we, so that when we bring something to you in the fall, um, you aren't looking at us like we're crazy. So uh, you don't have to answer that question tonight, but um, I think we need to start thinking about a retreat and you know what length of time and I, I'll, I'll I leave. Would suggest that you do it similar to what we've done where it's a special and not part of the work study because okay. I agree. one okay. when you go to work study we we're watching the clock because we all want to go home at nine o'clock and two when we come in here we've already spent the whole day working and you know it, when you do it first thing it's everybody seems to be a little fresher 
So Council Member Lucarelli isn't here. Why don't we all plan to bring in two weeks, bring our calendars so we can start talking about dates in, in January or February uh, to get, uh, and, and usually the directors are involved in that retreat too, or at least half the day. Um, we've got, Tony has been waiting patiently all night. He's been working two years to get bids on resurfacing the tennis courts at Van Z, and we finally have them, and it's uh, within $1,000 of the budget. Uh, there, oh gosh, he even brought a picture. Um, it's $24,000, and before we move forward though, I went out and looked at them. The contractor is concerned because there's significant cracking in the subsurface, and that they don't believe this will, we won't get the 20 plus years that we got out of them this time um, by doing this. They're recommending that we completely take the subsurface out to the tune of $150,000. And uh, I went out, there's nothing there that's a trip hazard. You can, some of the cracks are big enough that you could put your finger in them, but they are on the periphery and and or on foul lines a couple of them up but some of the small ones are up by the net i you know tony if you want to speak to it i think we can get a number of years out of just resurfacing but i want to yeah ac ace i can't say that word aesthetically it's a band-aid uh we've budgeted for this band-aid uh but if anybody's ever recoded their driveway, it's essentially the same thing with uh, with the tar uh, material that you're filling in cracks. Eventually, the cracks are going to reopen again. Uh, how many years we get out of that, I don't know. Uh, but for the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, it's that's a big ticket item, and it's not going to be done in the next couple of years. So. Uh, this has been a couple year project in the making and get the right amount of uh, money budgeted for it. So uh, it's really just what you guys envision uh, moving forward from here. So I, our courts would not be um, competitive tournament worthy if we just did the $24,000 alternative. Um, but Council Member Deanne. So um, I recall some years ago, we had a request from a pickleball association to line our courts. Yes, so they could that, this does that. This does that? Okay. Yes, this this has the pickleball uh, lines on one of the courts as well. Oh, that'd be <clears> awesome. <throat> yeah. I think and the picture doesn't do it any justice. It's The colors are going to be more vibrant than that. They're not okay. as dark. Uh, it's a brighter blue and a brighter green. I just didn't want us to go put $24,000 into these courts. And, <clears throat> you know, everybody questioned, well, there's cracks in the surface. Mr. Claus. I have no idea the cost or the viability of this, but a number of years ago, and you may have been on the council, when we coated the sidewalks downtown with the, uh, some kind of an epoxy with an aggregate in it mm -hmm. that fixed a lot mm -hmm. of the cracks and filled and leveled and all that sort of stuff. They're doing that with this process. It's just the cracks could develop again. Yeah, there's three coats of uh, emulsification as far as how long it's going to last uh, is to be determined. Well, this was a, a product that was like an epoxy resin. Yeah, it's a clear coat for the aggregate. Uh, it's, it's a clear yeah. coat that actually fills and holds the concrete together. They'll, they'll, they'll fill, they're going to fill, the, and this isn't concrete, it's, believe it or not, it's blacktop. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're, and they're going to fill these cracks. They're just, and, and, they're, and they aren't at all a trip hazard. It's just, <laughs> The expansion of this asphalt is it's cracked and separated and um, if it was at all a trip hazard I wouldn't say to move forward I just you know it isn't gonna be they aren't gonna be perfect I guess and it's we're spending a lot of money but I think it's still worth a, worth doing um, and I just wanted to bring it to your attention well, they're so. a lot better than the condition they are in today right. so it's yeah there's they're, grass growing in the cracks they might have been funded for five or six years so then yeah. what do we have yeah uh, well, we could coat this every five years for a number of years right. for the cost of the cost. Replacing, right. replacing, replacing it. it. Yeah. And it could last 10 years. I mean, who, who knows? The, the amount of use that's in that court is obviously isn't the extent of the high school. Uh, so it, it could last, who knows, 10 years. <clears throat> that, that's all I have on my mayor's report. So thanks for your 
indulgence. And I lost my agenda here. Staff reports. What do you got, Mr. Dorsey? Well, it sounds like your AWC board was very similar in certain topics to my public works board retreat last week. And Jerry Harmon doesn't know this yet, but I volunteered her to speak before the legislature, um, if you are willing, um, to represent a fixed income resident of a small city that will be impacted if the public works assistant account <coughs> continues to be rated by the legislature um, rather than the funding that's allocated going into infrastructure. Um, it continues to get rated. We had already established our budget and actually allocated projects and funding, and there were 12 additional last-minute legislative direct appropriations that took a big chunk of the allocated money out again. So we talked about um, one of our legislative priorities is our narrative, and I suggested that um, that we needed to humanize and personalize our narrative rather than the board just complaining about status quo. And so the board was receptive to my suggestion. So if Jerry is willing, being the eloquent speaker that she is, that she can speak before the legislature and just humanize the impact of having the, the account continue to be rated. So we can talk about that later. And this particular program provides the grants and low interest loans for the infrastructure and particular utilities um, that we all need. So, I uh, nothing Mr. further for me tonight. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Nothing tonight. Okay. Ms. Cates. Nothing for me. Thank you. Okay. Chief Brown. Nothing else. Thank you. Okay. Kirk Reinerson. Not for me either. Okay. We've got Deb Lund. Debbie Lund from HR. Shared it. Okay, and we heard from Tony. He only gets one bite at the apple, so. All right, so we're uh, to <coughs> our last uh, citizen comment period. Is anybody wishing to address the council tonight? Okay, Jerry, step on up. Sitting so long, I get so stiff. Um, Jerry Harmon, one of the things that I was wondering about on Einman's initiative Years ago, um, when he put the first one through about our car tabs, it didn't take long before things were added. Isn't there a two-year limit on most initiatives, and then this legislature can start making changes to them? Yes, you're correct. So at least if... As far as car tabs go, yeah, we're stuck with if that vote passes. I, it's likely there'll be litigation uh -huh. um, I've heard uh, okay. related well, to it. That's what I was wondering about, and something else whizzed right through, and it whizzed too fast, I guess, so I guess I can't talk about it. Okay, mm -hmm. I was wondering because um, I think that we have not only against the schools a group, but, and I do follow on some of the groups here in Port Orchard on Facebook, and there's a real negativity to um, the government and um, the way money is spent and so there could be a group out there that really comes at on you know at least for this issue that really pushing to um, you know get it passed just because of the group so anyway thank you yeah. thank you for your comments others wishing to address the council come on up Identify yourself for the record, if you could. Heidi Fenton. I live in Port Orchard. I'm just trying to get clarification and then trying to understand the process. So it was on number F up here when it says, adoption of a resolution fixing the date of a public hearing on a petition to vacate city, the city right away of the alley between Klein and Avenue and, and decab, decalb. So I just, I was looking on the map really quick and I was thinking, oh, okay, well, they're gonna have a public hearing on it. I can get a little bit more understanding. And so I was thinking, did you guys already vote on that or did you, okay, so you're waiting until like November 12th? Yeah, we voted to, we have to have a public hearing. Remember how we, yes. earlier we had those pu two public hearings, uh -huh. nobody testified. 
we'll, we're going to have a public hearing. Maybe somebody will come and testify for that. And then potentially after that public hearing, there could be an action from that. So oh, okay. the, tonight's action was for us to hold a public hearing about the vacation of the property. Okay, that's, that was my clarification. It's like, oh, and I'm asking, did they already vote? Because I hear all you guys say, yeah, yeah, and I'm going, oh, I don't get it. <laughs> so, I, so I'm kind of new to this. I want to start coming, you know, to be more involved in my community and what's going on in, you know, for the city. And I also agree, too, to have a public hearing for fireworks, because if you just vote on that, and then people say, what, what's going on? So I think that's really important to have public hearings and then also get information so people know about it because sometimes it's I don't if you're not really very very interested in something you don't really know it already had a public hearing and it's passed and now you have no say so there we go. Wonderful. thank you for your comments I have a discussion to address the council